Hello, welcome to Vet Talk, the veterinary podcast. I'm Dr. Nathan. Thanks for listening. This is an informational podcast, and we hope you find it a valuable tool to help you understand veterinary medicine and how to better care for your animals. If you want to contact us, please reach out to theveterinarypodcast at gmail.com. You can find a complete list of the podcast episodes on SoundCloud or by going to lickingvalleyvet.com and finding the education page. While you are there, take a look at our blog section for more helpful information. You can also follow Licking Valley Veterinary Hospital's Facebook page if you want regular updates on released podcasts, blogs, and videos. If you find this information helpful, please feel free to make a donation to the continuation of this content. There is a link to do this on the webpage under the podcast list. As always, thanks for listening, and I hope this information is helpful to you. So, the cow is born. Sweet baby angel laying there on the ground. What do we do now? Well, here in this episode, we're going to go from birth to death or sale of a cow. The recommendations I have come up with are specific for my area at this moment. They are a combination of what the book says and what practically is done in my region and a little hope of what will be done. There are many other ways of skinning a cat. Uh calf whatever so take them as any rule is supposed to be taken as guidelines my guidelines are basically to try to reduce stress on the animals vet students start thinking because i will be asking what is the single greatest stress on a a cow during its life so anyway back to that sweet baby angel that just fulfilled someone's goal of witnessing the miracle of life what do you do with it well not much. It's stressful to be born. No, vet students, this is not the single most stressful event a cow has in its life. I usually just let these calves be. Let the mother cow do her thing. Make sure the calf nurses and watch it for signs of disease. It will grow and you will have plenty of time to bother this little baby angel later in its life. Anyway, About two months of age is when I first recommend vaccinating these baby angel cows. Why do I keep calling them baby angels? Well, they are still cute. This will change. Cows grow up, and as they age, they become killing machines. Did you know cows kill more people in the United States each year than do sharks? Cows typically kill 22 people a year versus sharks killing 4 people a year. So yeah, think about that next time a cow stares at you stupidly while chewing its cud. It's really planning on how to kill you, and if it's worth the effort to go through it. Anyway, two months of age is when I recommend our first round of vaccinations. Our last episode goes over vaccination, so please listen to that for more in-depth discussions about vaccines. For now, just the quick and dirty. Give them a black leg combo, a tetanus combo, and tag or microchip them so you can identify them. You have to be able to track these animals so you know what each has gotten and how each is growing. Then let them back in the field with their mommies. At three months of age is when I get them back in and give a booster of the black leg combo, tetanus combo, and start your respiratory vaccines. Again, these are discussed in depth in our last episode. This visit to the cattle chute is also when I would castrate the bull calves. Technically, you can castrate them on day one of life. But again, we are trying to reduce stress. I want to castrate them before they get over four to 500 pounds, and at a time when they hopefully won't be too stressed by this event. And also, I like getting some vaccination on board. I see so many cattle farmers want to run their cattle through a head gate and work them once a year. This creates more stress. The cattle aren't used to going through the head gates. This creates stress. Then you poke them with a needle and do all sorts of unmentionable things to them, which creates more stress. If you spread these events out, the cattle won't be stressed going through the gates, and their body won't be reacting to as many vaccinations and stressful events at once. They will grow more, get sick less, and you will have more control at determining which protocols that you use are actually helping you 
put weight on these animals uh, if you have a scale. For example, if you are deworming with a topical dewormer and have been for the past five years and you see 10 pounds of weight gain between the deworming and the next time you run them through the chute, okay. Well, let's say you get an injectable dewormer and stop your pour on. Well, you see 20 pounds of weight gain you know that changing to that injection is helping you make money by having larger cows. But if you only run them through once a year and do everything at once, you won't know if that weight gain was because of the dewormer change or the fact that you gave a new vaccine and kept a disease out of your herd. The more you run these animals through and spread out things you do, the more idea you will have how each of your management strategies are affecting your herd. And back to vaccines. Disease is like racing you. Vaccines do not take effect immediately. Vaccines take two to three weeks to have protective effects. And in young animals, don't provide full immunity with your first dose. If you run your calves through once a year, give one vaccine and castrate. You're opening yourself up to danger. It takes two to three doses to get immunity from a vaccine and two to three weeks for diseases like tetanus and black leg to take hold. I've seen cows die of tetanus that were vaccinated two weeks ago. The tetanus beat the tetanus vaccine, which means the tetanus beat the cow, which means the farmer had a dead cow. So in a perfect world, you vaccinate. A month later, vaccinate again, and then in two to three weeks, castrate the calf. But we literally do not have time for this. So if you at least get one vaccine on board and then race the disease with the booster dose, I feel like the numbers are more in our favor for preventing deadly diseases like tetanus and black leg. So yes, where were we? Oh yeah, three months. Castrate the calf. How do we castrate calves? The most common way is banding. This is where a thick rubber band is applied around the base of the scrotum. This cuts off blood flow to the testicles, and then the scrotum and testicles rot off. I heard a few guys just reflectively flinch. Yeah, I don't like it either. This has been done for years, but is one of those things that cattle farmers should reconsider. I've been reconsidering it for years. Here's a little story. When I was in vet school on a beef rotation, we were scheduled to band a few bull calves. My rotation mates and I believed this was cruel to do and we decided we would tell our resident instructor this. And I was elected to be the group speaker. So up we marched and I said we don't want to perform this procedure. We think it isn't good medicine, increases the chance of disease, and is painful for six to eight weeks while everything rots off. I said this confidently under the glare of the resident, an experienced student that I was. As the glare grew in intensity, I looked to my left for the support of my fellow classmates. No one was there. Then I looked to my right. No one was there. Yeah, I'm calling you out, fellow Auburn beef mates. I can still remember that glare from the resident. Everyone else got some hands-on work that day. Anyway, it's easy to ban something. Anyone can do it and is commonly completed. Do we have alternatives? Yes, and this is what I recommend. Knife castration. I do this by restraining the calf, quickly cutting the scrotum, and then stripping the spermatic cord down. I apply some antiseptic spray and let the calf out. Oh my gosh, we found the single most stressful event in a cow's life! Ha <laughs> ha, no. I'm sure the boys don't like it, but it's not stressful on the girls. And in reality, it's not that stressful on the boys. But why do I like this procedure? It's quick. Pain levels are relatively low. It leaves an open wound which gravity can pull infection out of and it's easily completed except by people who are squeamish. And then it's healed up in two weeks. Studies have shown that even though it's a little more painful up front the wound heals in two weeks versus a slow chronic pain of six to eight weeks when banding a calf. And guess what? Those calves that are cut versus banded grow faster after recovery. So your calves get more weight by knife castration, which is exactly what we want as producers. Also, I see less post-surgical complications. This may be a little biased, 
So many animals are banded with no visits from the vet, but I have treated a good number of bandings that go wrong. The rubber band breaks early, or maybe is misapplied. That means there is a rotting thing hanging off the body that still has a really big blood vessel supplying it. And guess what? When something is rotting, it falls apart easily and is very hard to stop said big blood vessels. It's a bloody mess me trying to stop hemorrhage and infection when a banding goes wrong. And while it doesn't happen a lot, I've seen a few not squeamish farmers get a little pale around the gills while I work in literal pools of blood trying to stop hemorrhaging vessels. Does this happen a lot? No. But it's not a call I enjoy, and nor do you when I hand you the bill. So yeah, knife castration. I can teach you, and it will have less complications, be better for your growing calves, and will generally make you a happier person. So yeah, do that. And then kick them back out in the field for a month. At four months of age, I give the booster dose for a respiratory combo and deworm the calves. Here's a note for seasoned cattle practitioners. If you give your first dose of vaccine as a live virus and follow the second dose with a killed virus, you may get better immunity than just using live or killed vaccines. Oh, vet students, here we go. Two months later, we have made it to the most stressful moment in a cow's life. Do you know what it is? Weaning, you guessed it. No one likes leaving their mom. I mean, is there anything better than having your mom around? I still go over to mine for dinner many nights. I'm kind of hoping meatloaf comes back on the menu soon. Speaking of cattle has got me kind of hungry. Anyway, at six months of age, weaning is all I do. Don't do anything else at weaning. This is the this single, is the greatest, single stress greatest stress on a, stress cow, on a cow, cow in its cow, entire, cow, life. entire life. So just do this one thing. Uh, can I? No. Can I? No. Can I? No! One thing. That's all. Okay. So now everyone gets a break. And then we get to our annual things. So yearly, I recommend for adult animals a black leg combo, respiratory combo, deworming, tetanus combo, and anaplasma vaccine and weighing the animals. As well as giving any minerals or vitamins you need to for your area. Then, at one and a half years, deworm them again. Two years, repeat your annual stuff. If you want some more of my recommendations for specific vaccines, you can find that at LickingValleyVet.com under the ruminant section. But talk to your local vet for what they recommend specifically. I see some New Zealand listeners in the statistics for my podcast. I have no clue if this stuff works in Hobbiton, so call your local vets. Um, that kind of covers things. The last thing we're going to talk about for cattle are a few notes I've learned over the years and just some odd points that I didn't know where to stick anywhere else in this series. First, I'm not too big on vaccine brand names. These companies have been around for years and are all making effective vaccines that all have some pros and cons. If you want to get my snobbish side, talk to me about horse vaccines. One vaccine I don't push much is pink eye. Some people swear by it. I will sell pink eye vaccine if someone asks for it, but pink eye is not just caused by one thing. I think a vet student just cried saying they thought it was caused by Moroxella bovis. Well, it is, but it is really a multifactorial disease. Because so many things can cause pink eye, I feel there are better ways of controlling it than vaccinating for just one of the agents of its causation. Oh, well, what about those pink eye vaccines made by companies that are making the vaccine unique to your herd? Um, that's great. Do you have 2,000 cattle? Last I checked, they made doses of their individualized vaccine at a minimum of 2,000. Kind of hard to buy that many doses for one herd of 15 cattle. We may talk about pink eye more in depth in a later episode, but for now, that's my thoughts on it. I don't get too worked up about pink eye. Oh gosh, I'm running out of things to say about cows. I, I really wasn't planning on being a cattle vet. Yet somehow I know things about cows. And, well, they're needed. Because cattle vets are few and far between these days. Yet we still need cows so that we can, I don't know, have a burger. And leather products and everything else. 
Um, let's see, what else? Vet students, vet students. The answer on the exam for a cow question is cull it. Trust me, cull it. For producers, culling is removing a cow from your herd. I have a three strike rule. Three strikes and you're out. For example, the cow has a dystocia. Strike one. A month later gets a respiratory infection. Strike two. And a month later looked at me funny. Yep, it's gone. Looking at me funny was strike three. It has caused too many problems. It's not helping the herd or you. It has to go. Some other reasons to move an animal out of your herd and make it someone else's problem or to stock your freezer are 1. It's a bad disposition. Remember, these are large animals. They kill people. If it's trying to kill you, beat it to the punch. If you have to fix fence every time you work with a specific animal, it's costing you money and risking injury to other animals or people. Get rid of it. Also, I've noticed one wild animal can make an entire docile herd wild. The problem with most cattle farmers is they are too old to have grown up on Disney movies like The Lion King. Remember Scar and the Stampede and Simba and Mufasa? Oh my gosh, I can't even talk about it. Just get rid of your wild animals. If you don't do it for yourself, do it for Mufasa. Number two. If animals don't get bred, there isn't much point in keeping them. I mean, that's the name of the game. Number three, if 60 days prior to calving their body condition score is less than five, move them on. They will not rebreed easily. And then refer to reason two. Uh, number th four, animals that are not uniform. You know how Angus cows are prized meat? I don't know why. I have eaten Angus meat and I've eaten Hereford meat and couldn't tell the difference. But as people, we like uniformity. In the Civil War, most horses were sorrel or bay. Do you think there were many white horses in the war? Well, you may have had a few. But white horses make good targets. They stand out. One cow with a white face makes the entire herd of black cows stand out, and mentally, people just don't like buying those things that stand out at sale barns. They want a uniform big herd. So get rid of the parts of your herd that look different, and your herds will sell easier. 5. Speaking of white animals, if you have white cows, cull them. White cows are evil. Not black and white cows. We love our dairy cows. Just white cows. I am extremely racist toward white cows. White cows are crazy and evil and want to kill me. They probably want to kill you. They're just too busy trying to kill me. And I'm glad to distract you from them. I'm a trained professional. But if they get me, you likely won't see them coming. Now, let's say an animal dies before you cull it. We need to know why it dies. That's a necropsy, an animal autopsy. In Kentucky, we have a wonderful state diagnostic lab. They perform tons of tests for a reasonable fee, which if I ran individually would cost hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So use your state diagnostic lab. Most states have these. Sometimes cows just die from isolated incidents, like old age or lightning strikes but sometimes they die of disease that will spread and kill more animals. We won't know which it is until we complete the necropsy. If you wait for more animals to die, you may lose a large portion of your herd while we are waiting for results. One of the problems of Kentucky cattle herds is their small size of the herd. We expect 10 to 15 percent of the herd to turn over each year from you calling them, um, from natural deaths, and from accidents. In a herd of 100, this is 10 to 15 animals. With Kentucky's average herd size being 15, if you lose three animals, you are already above that percentage. So deciding when to send in dead animals from a small herd can be a challenge. Was the death from an individual problem, or will getting information prevent future problems? Results from necropsy can take up to two weeks because we are getting a lot of information back from these tests. So take action before you lose more animals. Information is power. 
Unless it's painfully obvious why an animal dies, I would always push for a necropsy. If you have information, you can make informed decisions. When you're guessing, it's like driving in the night without your lights on. You have a good idea where the road is because you can see the faint outlines of the uh, markers on the road. But if the road turns sharply and you can't see it, you can't react quickly enough and then you are off the road. That can happen with cattle too. If you don't get ahead of some diseases, it can ruin your herd. Also, please be willing to pay your vet for going over these necropsy results with you. The labs write this up in vet speak. For your vet's knowledge, please be willing to pay them as interpreting the results from the lab may save you thousands of dollars. Um, some other random facts. Growing cattle need 14% crude protein, 2 to 4 ounces of mineral, and at least 50% TDN, calculated by dry matter of feedstuff. Uh, let's see, stalkers in the growing phase need limited grain, mostly roughage, looking for a gain of 1.5 to 2 pounds a day. The finishing phase gets a high grain diet looking for average daily grain of 3 to 5 pounds a day. 25 to 30 pounds of grain per day will give an average daily gain of 3 to 5 pounds. There's some numbers for you. Um, oh gosh, is there anything else? Parasites and deworming for sure. But I haven't decided yet how to present that information. So until I figure that out, this is my cattle knowledge. Uh, do we need a benediction now after we've heard this multi-episode sermon? Go forth and be good cattle producers, and may young veterinarians continue to make the choice to earn the green badge of courage. Thanks for listening. I'm Dr. Nathan. I hope this information was helpful to you and gives you a little more perspective on the world. If you want to reach out to us, email us at theveterinarypodcast at gmail.com. Don't forget to tell your friends about our podcast and check out lickingvalleyvet.com for information on blogs, videos, and the complete list of podcasts in our education section.